Well, hello there, everybody. It's me, Griff, here with another GM Happy Hour. This time we're hosting it on the Hideous Laughter Podcast server. But tonight, we are talking about how you can improve your NPC game. How you can really embody these NPCs. Because we all know that the players get a ton of time with their characters. And you got to make your NPCs shine in like one or two sessions. So we're going to tell you how to do that. And I brought some friends along. You know them. You love them. Over here putting the min in min max. <laughs> Tyler, what are you drinking, buddy? Hey, man. Uh, drinking a uh, Marzen lager. It's a German-style lager. Uh, been really enjoying this one lately. Apparently nobody in my uh, local area enjoys this, so it was heavily discounted at my liquor store, and no, that's better for me. Steel. Well, another guy that puts a crisis in the dice crisis. What's That's up, me. Ballard? What's, What's up, drinking? Griff? I am uh, going to the land of sky blue waters over here. Oh. So, you know. What a beauty. Having a good time. Yeah, I, fig I figured you'd appreciate it, you know. You're I'm at the HLP. Kyle left his beer in my fridge, so it's all set. Hey, can't go wrong with the hams. And putting the fool in Southern Town Foolery. Hey, Adam. Hey. What you drinking, buddy? Uh, I am drinking a... High and hazy IPA from Terrapin. Um, it's high and hazy. They're they're right. They, there's like a whole description on the side here that's just a bunch of random words. Uh, it's a lot. I'm not gonna read them to you, but I did appreciate them. I'll put it like that. All right. As for me, I'm putting the slaughter in hideous laughter, and I'm drinking a big hugs. It's a trippy mm -hmm. little cat logo. It's a like imperial it. coffee stout with vanilla. Ooh. So I'm hyped for that. Robust. Yeah. Robust. I Robusto. I have, a, I have a stout for my sidearm that I'm looking forward to. A little milk stout nitro from Left Hand Brewing. Nice. Oh. Love me some Left oh. Hand. Yeah, that's good stuff. Well, guys, we're here today to talk about up in your NPC game. And I want to open it up to the entire group because I think at the beginning of this, we really need to talk about some strategies and some, I guess, philosophies when it comes to picking your darlings, as it were, when you go into a session and you have NPCs uh, that that you come up with on your own or that a adventure path puts in front of you and you have to make them a character that's memorable and fits into the story. How do you decide how much effort to put into that character? I think that's what where I want to start, and then we can kind of build off of that. So when you're thinking about your NPCs, how are you ranking those NPCs? Are they, you know, you have your BBEG, obviously he's at the top in terms of story impact, but maybe not in mm -hmm. terms of characterization, whereas your lowly, uh, you know, Boblin the Goblins, sometimes end up being your character favorite. So where do you, where do you put, what, where do you put your eggs in those baskets? Oh man. Uh, I, if I'm planning it, then it's going to be the NPCs that have the most to offer. Hold on. Let me see here. Oh, sorry. We're getting a little echo in the chat. How are we doing? Is this good? We better folks. All right. Um, yeah, so the, obviously there are some NPCs that are like crucial to the plot, you know, like, you know, you have your, your Sedonas or your Horace Croons, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but no, like, you, you know, you have, you have those ones that are, that are kind of, um, I don't know, the, the ex exposition vehicles, you know, mm -hmm, and yeah those are the ones that I want to bring up the most so they don't feel like just exposition vehicles, you know? So that's where I would start there. But oftentimes my most memorable NPCs come from reading the moment at the table, you know, but that, we'll get into that part of it later. But I would say on the planning aspect, certainly your, your big quest givers and, and 
any NPCs that are planning to be a part that are actually traveling with the party, if the AP is calling for that, or if you have an NPC in your homebrew that's going to be traveling, you want that NPC to be at least liked by the players, if not the characters, right? You want them to want to see them in the game. You for know? sure. And like, uh, to add to that, NPCs that end up either kind of connecting books together or are featured in two books or maybe down the line if they're still in town, uh, it's a good chance to, to have them show up momentarily before you actually have to have them have a big interaction. Uh, I've just, I know that the ones that uh, my players have connected with are the ones that they will they end up seeing again when they didn't necessarily know that they were going to be seeing them again and i think the a little foreshadow kind of meeting helps kind of connect plot points or or books in general yeah i think uh when it comes down to where to put your eggs in the basket i i, I agree with everybody so far you know, <clears throat> you've got the exposition NPCs, the ones that are there to give the story to the players, however they'll receive it, right? And sometimes mm -hmm. they don't receive the information or go through and ask the questions to the NPC like you expect they would. Um, I run into that pretty frequently with my group. <laughs> um, but, I mean, that's where that's where improvisation comes into play. But you can't improv unless you, did you press. I did. You did. Yeah. I did. A news oh. coming. A news yeah. coming. Well, we're like what six minutes in? Yeah. The improv train yeah. was coming. It's coming. I mean, it's, it's the NPC improv. characterization yeah. episode. <laughs> improv to avoid saying it. I Most saw it. Yeah, I did. Improv. Like when I was responding, I was like, uh, "What's happening in the moment?" You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really got around it. <laughs> yes, and um, yeah. <laughs> yes, and but, I would like to continue my statement. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, no, I, I think I think. Uh, Knowing your table has a lot to do with knowing where to put the eggs, the proverbial eggs in the basket as far as what you spend the most time with. Um, and you do have to spend time with these NPCs. Paizo Adventure Paths don't often give you what you really might want, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. Very frequently, word count prevents them from right. really fleshing out those NPCs on paper, so they leave that a lot in the GM. Um, I've come to appreciate that more the longer I, I GM, because you can't make overarching assumptions about tables as a publisher, and I think it's good that they just go real base on these sorts of things. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about my... Uh, approach on how I characterize my NPCs later, but I ask one question when I see an NPC, uh, not, not block, their the little uh, insert that they get in the book, and I ask why. And whichever NPCs end up having the most interesting why, or what I would think have the most interesting why to my table specifically, those are the ones I focus on the most. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I find myself focusing on what I like to call mini protagonists. And so these are not your players, but they're the NPCs that are either on a journey with your players for a little bit or have the same goals as your players. They're generally your, not just quest givers, but also the, the kind of NPC that is going to actively work with your party. Yeah. Or the kind of NPC that's going to be around your party uh, while they're completing the main quest line and those i those are the first eggs i put in the basket they're my most important npcs and they're the ones that i try to build off of that paragraph that we get i try and build it into a fully realized character that is quickly realized that has a couple quirks that mm -hmm. make them that endear them to the party if they're going to work with the party after that i have my main antagonist so you have your mini protagonist and you have your main antagonist and that can be your book ending bosses your uh your antagonistic party as a whole if there's a party working against the party and those i think are important to think of in broad strokes in terms of how their goals are connected how their goals connect within the books and how they would react to certain situations uh organically because a lot of times the way they're written in some of these books isn't necessarily 100 percent organic or if you don't fill in the gaps you get a lot of almost plot hole like situations with those npcs where it's like well why did this happen like why why are we doing this or why 
why did they do that before they did this when they could have just done this? You kind of have to fill in the the behind the scenes gaps for those ty- kind of characters. Mm-hmm. And then the ones I really you know focus on are the, <laughs> are the ones that I know my table loves. So those are the ones that aren't necessarily plot relevant. They're not necessarily uh, bad guys or good guys, but they're the ones that my players have connected with and uh, they root for, they want to see recurring. Those are the kind of characters that then I, you know, if I have to divulge some more plot, I might funnel it through those characters just because they've already endeared themselves to the party, even if they don't necessarily have that information in the written work. Sure. Yeah. So I think that's how I that's how I tend to prioritize, and then everybody else, you know, you'll you'll hear me on my show. Like everybody else gets like one of four different voices, <laughs> but they're not like they're not really uh, they're not fleshed out. And you can kind of tell when I'm grasping at straws for even a name. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. God, that's like GM's worst question, or like most feared question. Oh, and what's your name? And you're like the uh, 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 uh. Stephen. You know, I, I have a quick anecdote <laughs> on that. My party has started to realize when I do that. And so I've started to do that on purpose for written characters. Oh, Ooh. nice. Well, and so I've started, I've started to fuck with them and like think of a name on the spot, tweak a character's name to make it more like a, you know, I had a, I had a character that had some long, complex name and I was like, uh, his name's Chauncey. <laughs> <laughs> but like he was a character written Chauncey. in the book, but like. It, it makes them, it makes, it changes the party's expectations, which is kind of fun. For sure, for sure. Mm. Like, I definitely had a dumb name, and then they latched on to that character because it was just a dumb character, but then I I had to bring them back into the plot because of how much they enjoyed that stupid little interaction. Well, my party gives a nickname to every NPC they meet immediately, so it doesn't even matter what their name is. They're like, uh, no, no, that's, I'm sorry, you're Areola Skrillex from now on. Yep. <laughs> Can't give okay. him a funny name. It's close nope. to Areola. Yeah, yeah, Good old like, Areola. Oh, we're taking that, yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So we have how you prioritize NPCs, at least from, you know, the general vibe of the group is obviously we're, we're going for the ones that are more plot relevant and working with the party probably a little bit before uh, the background characters, as it were. But how do you, how do you hook your party? How do you hook your party when you only have, you basically have a first impression with these NPCs? Uh-huh. So how, how are you guys digging the talons into your party when you need an NPC to really be a recurring character i mean one of the easy and most visceral ways to do it and you've already touched on a little bit is to to have a distinct voice for the character you know it's something that is is different than your kind of like go-to bag of npc voices right you you have one that you've made specifically for this and you know if it's a situation where you can do a distinct and kind of like quirky accent that's a quick way to do it, but not everybody feels comfortable with doing voices and or, or you know, really wants to to do that. Um, so I'm gonna, I just said that to kind of get that one out of the way first, right? You know, um, that if you're comfortable doing voices, and I will say, like, you don't have to be a professional voice actor to do voices. Like, none of us are <laughs> at at all. You know, well, you know. Yeah. Um, maybe it shows who knows <laughs> yeah but like <laughs> it doesn't it, that that's not what's important about the voice mm-hmm. is it being like well executed it's about being memorable you know what i mean and so like you know have fun with it if you feel comfortable other other things I and mean, then it gets a little bit more tricky you know because then you have to then it comes into like what are you saying as the npc or how are you describing the npc in a way that gives your players something to latch on to, you know? Yeah, I think another way, uh, just like to step, get a step away from just voices is like speech mannerisms or just like having a character, like having somebody speak faster or having somebody really enunciate something or emphasize things different than you would normally talk in your narrator voice. Mm-hmm. I think that that's just a contrast right there that anybody can kind of easily pick up on. And it's easier to do than... Uh, figuring out a special voice. Mm-hmm. You know, I find generally that a lot of people focus too much on what the voice 
how they come up with a voice. Like, how do I, how do I come up with a voice? You know, uh, a lot of times if you focus less on the voice and focus on ticks that that NPC might have, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. a lot of times your subconscious will fill that voice in. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if hold you've got your mouth in a different way like, yeah, and just talk normally, but just pull. hold your mouth in a different way. Yeah. You yeah, know, pull, like pull one side back or yeah, do the good, good old orc yeah, stuff. It, it's it's going to make things stuff. sound different. You yeah. Know? Like yeah. without having to do anything, without having to change your voice at all, just change the shape of your face. I mean, with the, the sounds that we make are entirely by the way we shape our mouth and our tongue and, and yeah. like how we breathe through it. So those are really the things that you're changing when you're doing a voice. You know, you don't have to do accent work to have different voices. You know, you don't have to be good at a British accent and be able to do a Spanish accent and be able to do a French accent. Like, that's not necessary to do a distinct voice. But I think what you guys sure. are talking about kind of transcends the voice. It doesn't have to be a vocal tick. I think if you can pick one personality characteristic that ma that makes that character stand out, it makes the character interesting. For if sure. you have a character that mm -hmm. often repeats himself or is often, like, braggadocious or is often... A, doing a certain thing acting in a certain way mm -hmm. or uh or is overly complimentary or something you can you can give off a completely different vibe to your party by having it, because you you don't have the time to build a whole player character you kind of have to make these characters if you want them to be memorable be a little bit one-dimensional in that way mm -hmm. yeah I, I think another good tactic is just over describing a person at least my group knows right away if somebody's going to be important if i'm like going in full detail on their appearance and like what sure. they're wearing and, right. and what they're doing i think that's an easy tactic to get players to pay attention without having to do some kind of flashy voice i think uh what what all this kind of gets at is that there's a certain cadence that is going on in a game like a normal paced game where you know, you, you meet some monsters that don't have much personality, you fight them, you go through the combat, you know, and you get in a cadence of this kind of narrative flow that just propels. If you want an NPC to stand out, s slow that momentum down a little bit. Like Griffin is saying, focus on their descriptions, you know, let them let what they're describe little details of what they're wearing that might suggest a personality trait or a history that you want them to ha that you want them to exude but it's not necessarily something that makes sense to to verbalize to say you know mm -hmm. but like uh, the an example that comes to my head just off the top is like if you had if i were to describe somebody that was wearing like a green jacket and they had like a, a button on it with a happy face but a bullet hole on the top you'd already get an idea a little bit about that character where they're coming from they're a little cynical per, you know perhaps has some war experience you know like and that's just one little detail that can help embody that moment in that npc a little bit more and yep. you know when you have more time and you don't have to just come up with it off the top of your head you can really develop that into something easy to to identify an npc so when we think about the personalities of our npcs then as as we've said uh, often with a pre-written adventure especially there's there's not really even hardly a skeleton on some of these characters they are glorified quest givers in mm -hmm. some respects i mean it honestly in some of the adventures i've read it's like here's the little blurb this person says yeah <laughs> that's that's <laughs> what they it. say that's it that's them yeah he's and, from this place here's what he says <laughs> mm -hmm. and so how so how do you guys give how do you flesh that out how do you give them personality and do you do that ahead of time, or do you find yourself, for lack of a better term, improving that character? <laughs> I find myself improving the character more often than not. Uh, <laughs> but I definitely, you do like automatically give some thought, and uh, once you can kind of picture a character in your head, it's easier to to kind of play that character, I guess. So uh, even if there's not a whole lot of description at least choosing some things in your mind that seem to like make you understand who that person could be or what their character is uh can just go a long way in, in a moment mm -hmm. um, especially if 
if like there is some some text and something's written kind of weird or chunkly if that that if like reading that or if you have tried to memorize it or just like skim or whatever if it leads into some sort of like uh, like mess up in your sentence you can like play into that and all of a sudden there's a this guy kind of stumbles over his words or says weird shit off the off the cuff i don't know Mm-hmm. Well, and I think when you know, we're talking about uh, you know what what you're given in a pre-written adventure, um, an easy way to flesh that out, in, in my opinion, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, is asking why. You know, why, based on the two sentences that you're given, why are they like that? In the context of the adventure, or the story, or the information they're being they're giving the party, it it really helps even just to pull out like a. a a Mad Libs pad and just toss an NPC name into, you know, a little, a little Mad Libs sheet and just fill it out. Be fun with yourself during prep, uh, in fleshing that out a little bit and asking that why question preempts what your party is going to do, which is why is this person talking to me? You know, I think one thing that, that is really interesting that, that, Allard actually brought up a couple of episodes of this ago that could be really useful for prepping NPCs. Was uh, Allard, you had talked about to your to your players presenting them with kind of mundane questions about their characters, like what is your character's favorite food, oh, yeah. what is your character's yeah. favorite color, yeah, yeah. to kind of get into that character's headspace. And I think that could be useful for NPCs as well. Maybe not necessarily as deep down as what is their favorite food. But asking these kind of more mundane day-to-day questions of these NPCs can really help you form an opinion of this character and help you play them better. True. I think at the end of the day, um, turning that little description into a memorable character is also about acting. In some respects, if you don't act convincingly as that character, you're not going to be able to sell that character very well. And then that character sometimes can become a here's a couple blurbs quest giver and not right. a character that the party latches on to. So getting yourself into the headspace with little questions like that, I think, can be super helpful. I'm going to offer just a, a, a contrary or maybe an alternate, not necessarily contrary, but... I also think, like, as they say in jazz, sometimes it's about the notes that you don't play, you know? And in order to make the NPCs that you want to stand out stand out, sometimes you got to know when to, like, breeze through an NPC and just let them be an extra. You know what I mean? Like, not every barkeep has to have a full-on personality and and boisterous quirk, you know? Mm -hmm. Like... If you want to, sure, but like if not everything needs to be acted out, you know, and I think that if there are NPCs that you're really concerned about wanting to shine, don't surround that NPC with a bunch of other like star NPCs. Give well, it's like NPC- the Incredibles, like if everybody has superpowers, nobody does. Right. If exactly. every NPC is super fleshed out and super quirky none of them are Mm -hmm. yeah or like npcs that are at like random stores or just little places that the party's kind of going to come back to i found it kind of easy to maybe describe or go through a little rp like once with that character and then when they want to come back to those places it's kind of like half interactions i'll pull the voice from oh what are you guys doing here blah blah blah. just Mm -hmm. kind of move it on and let them get their stuff and get out and get back to their world instead of kind of trapping them in a, in an RP scenario every time. Well, and not every NPC wants to interact with your party either. Right, right. Some RPs just want to tell your party to buy their shit to get the hell out of my store, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and and it's it, that introduces both a little you know RP realism into it, but also does what Griff is saying and what Adam's saying, which is, uh, you know, let the silence be there. This isn't a star. They're here to fulfill their role as a shopkeep and they want Mm -hmm. you the hell out. You can give them a little bit of personality while they're doing that. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but they don't have to be a focus, which means to that NPC, the party isn't their focus. Their day-to-day life is their focus. Right. Um, and that's an okay thing to do, you know, to, 
maybe not so gently to tell your party or your players' characters to, you know, F off and go about your day, right? Mm -hmm. um, Leave me the hell alone, please. <laughs> maybe, you know, but get out, get depending. Out. How many uh, wands of Cure Light Wounds can you possibly fucking need? Like <laughs> <laughs> A lot, all right? Gold is gold, baby. <laughs> it's the most efficient way to do it. <laughs> So, how do you guys handle then when the players latch on to an NPC you don't want them to? Hmm. Kill them. Maybe it's just maybe <laughs> it's just improv. <laughs> you know, it's like it's the exact uh, Boblin the Goblin always talked about scenario where it's just like some throwaway thing that they latch on to that is kind of not even plot adjacent. God, oh, have have the NPC offend the party. I kind of yeah. kind of repeating myself a little bit here, right? <laughs> um, but you know. If if you give the players a reason to be interested in an NPC, they're going to continue to be interested. Um, disappoint them. That's okay. If they're not important to the story and you need them to move on to, from it, uh, or even you're sick of doing that NPC, or <laughs> you know maybe my voice hurts and I don't want to keep doing my goblin voice, uh, then yeah, yeah, give them a reason to not like that NPC. You know your table. You know what their triggers are, right? Trigger them. Or maybe that just that NPC just isn't around anymore. He's he left town. He's he's not he's hiding. He's he's been sick for the last week. Yeah, oh, we gotta go on an expedition to go find Boblin now. Side oh, we quest. Gotta heal him. You, we gotta heal you him. Can't, dude, you cannot leave any mystery around an NPC that you don't want them to interact with. <laughs> Fair you know enough. I mean? <laughs> you leave one unanswered question about their NPC. Say it's say goodbye to the main adventure. Go on, on the side quest to track down Bob. Oh, it's got to end it with a pile of the big bad uh, the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> or or we'll just have your NPC what what if you just decided to be bad at improving a conversation for those NPCs you you didn't want to keep playing. That well, that would shut down your players a little bit. <laughs> They'd be like, "Oh, this sucks. This is, <laughs> Let's this, move this on. Sucks. This guy just sucks to talk to." <laughs> I don't know if that's the best advice that we should it's not. give to, to. But hey, uh, it's like just suck and then they'll <laughs> just not suck a little bit anymore. more. Yeah, just uh, suck a little bit. All right, point <laughs> taken. <You're good. laughs> Yeah, I mean, so I, so I think that's that's obviously one way to handle that, but creatively, can you can you swing that into plot adjacent? Can you take that NPC then that doesn't you know you hadn't planned is maybe a completely made up NPC and swing them into a plot adjacent role in order to provide the party with what they need with the. Uh, character that they seem to want to get the information from or they want to interact with is is that equally as valid of a strategy i think uh in certain ways it, it does work to do that to have the information kind of change spots much like we talked about when players want to go in a different direction in the campaign and now what was west is east uh, okay. i think you can turn oh, yeah. those turn those NPCs that the players do love into also important characters mm -hmm. without yeah. much, I mean, in, unless you shot yourself in the foot and you're like, well, he doesn't fucking know anything. <laughs> he's, a, he's a big <laughs> dumb dumb, but you love him anyway. But like, he's not a part of this. So it says right here, he doesn't know anything doesn't about know this Jack. adventure, so sorry. It's well, I mean, here, Seymour Wiener is in the book and like, he, <laughs> you know, he, has this, he has this little blurb he's supposed to say, but that's all he does. Guys. Well, I, I mean, if you think about it, when you're looking about an NPC that, you know, like you're talking about making them plot adjacent, uh, that NPC is supposed to be interesting to your party and they're supposed to deliver the information and or hook or item or whatever that they're supposed to get to progress the story. Uh, why not make it somebody that they've always already fallen in love with? That's half of your job done. You just give the information to somebody else. You're absolutely right that's a great way yeah. to do it I'll, I'll, all it really takes is just maybe flavoring the information to a slightly different perspective on how they would kind of either see that next quest or how they i don't know divulge the information that the party actually gets yeah i mean i won't lie i've definitely made a voice annoying so they would not want it like the players wouldn't want to hear it anymore i've done that a <laughs> couple times you know like i, I can mean, think of a time in uh in hideous top <laughs> when you do that you so key uh, shop, oh but see dude. that but that one like now it's like my personal mission yeah, to just do it. as so much as i can joy. yeah yeah like i like that i like twisting it with you but like for like um 
the uh, hash. Like I hated doing Hash's voice, so I made him annoying. I couldn't but, tell. All right, do that. <laughs> do it once for us right now. Uh, I'm getting, yeah, I feel gross. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have COVID-19. <laughs> oh, no. And so, like, with Bright Bright, I thought that that would be, like, obnoxious in that they would, like, get a kick out of the first time that they would never go back. But no, no. I Everybody loved Bright that. Bright. Yeah. Yeah, I like, everybody loved Bright Bright. Yeah. And I ended up having to do that way longer than i wanted to <laughs> for sure it's tough to improv so for those of you that haven't watched our shows adam's talking about a character on his show that speaks very fast in a very kind of circular way to get to his point and it as somebody that does npcs it it sounds exhausting to do yeah it does it was, man it was it was i mean you know respect to bright bright like i i i know i know what it did for me as a GM, <laughs> but like, I'm glad that bright, bright is retired, yeah. you know, and no egg, you're not getting bright, bright. <laughs> <laughs> I find myself in a situation where, um, and this is, this is probably more specifically to us. We're kind of talking about our shows a little bit. Now there've been some NPCs that I've done, um, that I really honestly thought were just going to be one-off NPCs, but then, you know, my party didn't latch onto them. I didn't latch onto them, but then I get feed listener feedback and I'm like, oh shit, you guys really like this NPC a, a lot. Okay. <laughs> All right, we'll bring him back, right? Mm -hmm. It's different for us, I think, because we have a third. Yeah. We have a third party that most people don't have to worry about, or Fair. have to listen to. Guys, sorry, <laughs> that, to wasn't, to. that wasn't that <laughs> wasn't. Don't like, take what? that the wrong way. I, I'm confused by what you mean, though. <laughs> You're confused by um, wait, like uh, what do you mean by a third party? The audience. The audience? Oh, 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 okay. I'll, the audience is the third party. Yeah, As okay. a show, you have another yeah. opinion that's not just your party's yes. opinion, right, but correct. also the yes. listener's opinion yes. on the characters. Well, 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 well. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't think my players have ever have like latched on to somebody who had a, a weird voice. I mean, there's a couple of reoccurring things, but never anything that was like hard for me to do that was that they came back to or... I don't know. I feel like they don't revisit a lot of my PCs or NPCs now. Huh. Jeez. Huh, you guys. So I made more interesting. You better start listening. Yeah, to maybe I'm, I guess well, I'm just not doing very good on those <laughs> keywords. Yeah. Well, you, you know, Look, I'll give it to you, Allard. Try to be more annoying. You're, you're more annoying. Yeah, is, you're, the, is the message. Your AP moves fast between yeah. many locales. There really isn't the opportunity for that to occur a ton. Yeah. Um, or maybe maybe you have like twenty episodes to really do something, and then it's really on to the next spot. It's gone from there. Yeah. So that that sounds like a good jumping off point to uh, how to connect NPCs, uh, and and I think a lot of us are doing it in in our adventures right now is connecting an NPC, uh, either introducing them a bit earlier or making them relevant longer in an adventure than they necessarily were written for, uh, and how you connect their story uh, organically at a point where maybe they weren't meant to be introduced or at, through a point where they probably should have left. Uh, how do you guys feel about that, and how do you pull it off well? Well, if I knew. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> I, I, in the background, call those bridge NPCs Yeah, because they bridge books. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're talking about uh, when you have an adventure path, there's the pr the producer of the adventure path, like, uh, you know, the guy who lays out the, the storyboard for books one to six, and then they get six to seven, eight different authors to do the rest of the books, and they're not always cohesive units between the books, you know, going between, certain, and I'm sure you feel this hard with Carrion Crown, uh, Griff. Um, those are six totally separate entities uh, in page form, right? Uh, you've done a great job bridging the books, in, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, it's a good idea to have bridge NPCs, but they don't write those in. I think that they're... I think it's hard to do that because so much of what happens is dependent on a group of protagonists that they can't write. You know what I mean? Like, the the every table is going to play the adventure different and everybody's going to latch on to different NPCs and like, and so what you, I think what it, what it comes down to with bridge NPCs is to just have the courage to break from the book 
and be like, okay, well, my characters did these actions, and it this this NPC would interact with them earlier now because of the actions that they did. Or, you know, when you get your backstories from your players, if you're getting rich backstories or, you know, lot, you, know you say, okay, is there a way? I mean, you know, you're... The story should be about the players, so don't be afraid to be like, okay, well, this backstory has a character that might have known this NPC. Is there a way that I can tie that together, you know? So when they meet this NPC, they're like, oh, shit, like, that's that dude from my backstory or whatever, mm -hmm. you know? And, like, and, and I am a big fan of teasing out the, the BBEG early, you know what I mean? Like, I like there to be this kind of ominous feeling that's kind of weighing over the adventures because oftentimes as they're written you don't see or hear from yeah the villain until the battle with the villain you know what i mean <laughs> they've and been so, working in the background the whole time and, and so you're reduced to this ridiculous james bond style speech to get all the exposition out about why <laughs> you're here and why you're fighting this and why, you know, why you're wrong as the party. And here's why I'm right. You know, where there's, I think other ways using NPCs that can help characterize that BBEG by their experiences with them, you know, tie the NPCs to the, to the, to the end of it and let them kind of like give the players, these stories, these tales of this, you know, great evil or whatever it is that they're going to take down. You know, I think that that, is a great way to make an NPC memorable, bridge them, and get some of that end game feeling earlier into your story. You know, yeah. It's... Like if a if a quest giver had come across the big the BBEG, and like they have this harrowing story to tell the PCs about how they were bested by them or how they were outmatched by them. The PCs who are looking up at this guy already is gonna just gonna see, think that the BBEG is just so much stronger than them and something that they could never uh, overcome. But then when they get to it, it's it's the it, they they can do it at that point. And I don't know. Well, and and Cooking. doing doing that is difficult when you've got especially when you've got the puppet master. Whoops, when you got the puppet master BBEG. You know, the guy who specifically has just a bunch of lower enemies. Uh, I think, I can't think of any AP that does it, that's the worst at it. And I don't want to, I know of one offhand, but I'm not going to bring it up because it's one of ours. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, but I think probably uh, there are good examples of adventure paths uh, doing that. Uh, I look at Rise of the Rune Lords actually does a very good job in book um, foreshadowing the BBEG. You see sprinkles of him throughout every book getting to the point where he speaks to the players, um, not in a two-way conversation, uh, but he speaks to the players at a certain point, and that's written in. And, and there's ways that you can sprinkle that BBGE BBEG, damn it, out through the entire adventure uh, without being too heavy handed and still give them that puppet master vibe. You know what I mean? Yeah. I yeah. I can say that uh, the BBEG in mine, like, there wasn't much written that uh, in the first, well, two, three books that we're in so far to give the flavor of, like, what their end goal kind of is. So I, I have taken the that opportunity to like foreshadow them in like in the journals that they found at one point or like in some vision that they were given or kind of those types of things. I think it it has helped steer them in a direction in a in a way without like forcing them that way, but getting a look at where the end of the tunnel could be. Yeah. Uh, jazz my ears on but what I am gonna say here is that it I did not take a graceful approach with uh, tying bridging NPCs and I recommend that you don't either I agree uh, I took a shotgun blast at at the front of the adventure if you have a main event in your adventure and you can introduce multiple people into that spot do it shotgun blast it see what sticks throw shit at the wall see what sticks because those personalities are going to be the ones that you're going to be able to use as bridges 
from the beginning to later in the story when they're supposed to show up. And I think it's I think it's a good idea for anyone running a pre-written adventure that has a big event to start it to introduce NPCs from across the adventure that could plausibly plausibly be there. It, it maybe not in something that's like a adventure romp around Galarian, but especially for these adventure paths that are like you're in one city or on, on one island or in one continent and uh, everything maybe a little bit spread out but it conceivably the the npcs could be where the pcs are at the beginning of the adventure i say go for it like throw some of those personalities out so that if anything those npcs become memorable because the players remember them mm -hmm. they were there <laughs> exactly yeah. they, they make yeah. the connection if even if it's not in a the backstory they make the connection that they've met this person before and that person immediately becomes interesting yeah yeah i really okay. enjoyed how you did that at the funeral by the way thank you i haven't had a chance to really tell tell you about that but i i really appreciated that when i first heard it especially being familiar with carrying crown myself um i think yeah. i think it brought the funeral to like out too yeah, yeah for sure I, had to have, I mean because it was like a whole episode of me uh, you meeting this whole cast of you know it's a gothic horror so the way i see it is like most gothic horrors introduce kind of like this colorful cast that all eventually usually in a typical gets killed off one by one mm -hmm. uh, and and so it was just cool to see all all different flavors of the gothic horror right there at the beginning um, and then as we got going, realizing that, oh shit, we met like, we continue to come back to these people that were blips in episode one. It's like, oh cool, shit, all right, all right. And, and that's just really slick. Um, I'll say one of the things that that done in the in the show, uh, Southern Tom Foolery is like, you know, we do flashbacks, and so I guess it's specifics to to if your table does the kind of cut scene type um scenes you know at your table but if you do you know you can use those to like take a moment to look at the bbeg or somebody that's working for them you know you have these like little interludes that kind of give you this kind of omniscient perspective of something brewing you know you don't want to give too much but like in both seasons we did i did a little prologue that like kind of shows the bad guy in their capacity of what they can do it doesn't really give you any answers about like any motivations or anything but it's just a hey this is this is a snapshot of like why this is the evil or the you know the thing you need to stop and then like i did do a straight up flashback of the bbeg of aeon throne because i didn't want to go through the whole james bond speech but i want i felt like his backstory was interesting and i wanted it to get there so I just fucking did it, you know? <laughs> you know, some of the best a uh, action movies, uh, scene one is not the protagonist. It's mm -hmm. the antagonist. And you did that really well with him, by the way. Thanks. I mean, that and, and it's just, I don't know. There's just lots of ways that you can do it. I think a lot of it just takes a little bit of bravery and, and, and um, you know, confidence in yourself to, like, Eschew what you think you're supposed to do because the IP is telling you to do it. Like, you've all heard all of us talk to AP writers, right? They all say the same thing. We're expecting the GMs to, like, add to, move around. We're giving you a framework. We have a word count. There's obviously so much more that can go into every single encounter, story beat, everything. And, and, so do it like it's meant to be a guide not a definitive roadmap you know like change it use the npcs where they make sense and how what if there's an npc you like as a gp gm regardless of what your players want or like if you like him as a gm identify with them and put them in your game how you want them have you a little favorite gm NP npc you know what i'm saying best gm what, what advice you? tonight it's your game too. You're allowed to have fun, damn it. Mm -hmm. Word. What What do you think about then developing a an NPC in a different direction than the uh, than the book had them? Uh, specifically, I I think about you know an example for me is 
out of a combat comes um, negotiation and eventually friendship with uh, these intelligent creatures that end up like befriending the party and helping the party in a couple of uh, alchemical zombies. And like, if you play that, like the book says to play that, it's, you know, it's, it's a dead player character potentially. Uh, and uh, my players were in a trial at the time, a lack of evidence in the trial. Um, so I took that a different direction. And I think uh there's a lot of opportunities in these APs for based off of GM player interaction for these NPCs to develop in a way that maybe you didn't expect. Has that for happened sure. to you guys? And do you, I mean, do you foster that kind of thing? Yeah. I, uh, off the top of my head, one character, uh, he like, they writ, they wrote him to almost be a, a quest giver and then just like dip out completely. But I found that it made way more sense for him to kind of, join the party whenever he could and like like i he was able to like bring them to the next de destination because it really really made sense that he would have gone with them but the ap wrote that no he had to stay back around around the first place and and just just chill out just in case he was ever needed again over there but right and so that's a, another example of the restrictions that that writer had they're writing a, a book for four pcs you're mm -hmm. playing with three pcs so adding him to the party doesn't screw with the balance of the rest of the adventure so you can like it so yeah. that's one th one advantage that you have is you can plug in any npc into your party and they can go and you've done that a I lot have. Throughout i've the, been you know? liberal with that yeah. <laughs> which is great yeah. really strictly yeah. in npcs we had NPCs. We've, we've had up up to two npcs that that just like traveled with the party to help them do their thing but i think that works though and i think you you've done you've done well with that you know and i i, I want to ask tyler <laughs> you know a lot of your npcs get shit from your oh, players yeah. i'm a player call out all of the min max y'all give this <laughs> motherfucker a hard ass time dude like, <laughs> like and you know you're doing it too like it's a meta level hard time on top of in game hard yeah, time. yeah 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 i mean it's, my it's the flavor of the show don't change yeah I'm exactly just saying, I, i'm just saying how do you what you know how do you deal with that when you're you have an npc that i know that you're like okay I'll, this is going to be this is important and i'm trying to get some like importantness out and all you're getting is yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, a particular. Why are you even talk to us? We're circus folk. Yeah, a particular <laughs> ghost comes to mind to me right now. Um, mm -hmm. But, but you know, I, 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 to an extent, I lean into it um, because one of my my party and I get a lot of enjoyment out of riffing each other. We we rib each other consistently throughout our games. We we love doing it. We laugh about it, and we have a good time. Nobody takes it personally. We've been really mm -hmm. good friends for a long time. So so I do. I lean into it a lot. Um, but it also for for my adventure particularly, you know, running a a, a circus, a bunch of circus folk. It allows them to reflect on their own nature as as players as well you know a lot of times they'll come back to the we're circus folk what are you coming to us for this for but that that allows them to reminisce uh or even you know take a step back and see their own hero's journey from being mm -hmm. just the the circus folk to being movers and shakers in the world and uh i, I, I it's like good. that they're the last people that need like they're the last people that are going to be convinced that they're the heroes of this story 100 you know, like, everybody everybody else is like i mean they're getting all the signs and they're like you know i i'm i'm not sure yet i, I you know i know that we did this big thing and like you know it's a big deal but again we're just circus folk. it's great it's a great dynamic you know and you do you do handle their their kind of blase attitude to the npcs pretty well and, and for their part they will let the information get out at, at some point. At some point, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 eventually, <laughs> eventually. After uh, they've like taken all their stuff or something. Yeah, 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 <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think, you know, part of, part of that with my group, I, I talked a little bit about knowing your table. When I see an NPC and I ask, you know, why is this NPC like this? And the second question is, how is my party going to react to it? Um, I, I see that coming, right? ahead of time it allows me to prepare how they'll react to a certain extent too 
um, uh, player call out, y'all are predictable. Uh, <laughs> got him. <laughs> got him. Um, oh, yeah. But, you know, it's it's just uh, if you know who your players are and you know what, what characters they're playing, you can prepare for that and use it to your advantage. Um, and it's something that, that every GM has to learn to do to an extent. C- can I tell you guys a story real quick? Um, Fine. It was... <laughs> Thanks, Allard. <laughs> I appreciate the permission. I guess. Um, I'm going to open another beer, though. We were, t- <laughs> we were talking about the James Bond mo- like evil villain monologue. Right. Um, for the longest time as a, as a GM, I allowed the book to hold my hand through things and not uh, take the extra steps to bridge the NPCs into my party. Um, and I had one character who disabused me of that notion very quickly. His name was Wyeth. You know who you are. And every <laughs> single time that I would start monologuing, he would say, I shoot him in the face with my arrow. <laughs> and I'd be like, but he's in the middle of talking. And even the other party members were like, well, we're getting information from him. He's like, I don't care. That's what my character would do. I shoot him in the face. He's distracted. Kill him now. Uh, and, and agency spell wind wall. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's, it's one of those things where, uh, you know, your, your players will tell you that they don't like something in their own way. Yeah. yeah. Even if it's, you know, a lot of people in our hobby won't actively tell you that they don't like something because a lot, I think a lot of players are afraid to say, I didn't like this thing because, oh God, you're GMing for us. Keep GMing for us. I love everything that you do all the time forever. Right. Where are those I'm players? a new GM. You're on the streets. <laughs> Where are those players? You like I, that? I, I, I don't, I don't share this experience. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so I have a question actually GM to GM because, um, I'll, I'll drop a, a slight spoiler. We're we're talking about our second show here, and it's going to be uh, for for the Hideous Laughter podcast. It's going to be an urban style adventure, and uh, the, in an urban adventure, NPCs are ever present. You're not They're moving around there. a lot. You have NPCs yeah. from book one to book six, mm-hmm. and so I'm curious how you guys handle NPC downtime. So what what these NPCs do in their in their lives when they're not face to face with the party, and how you handle kind of these these background because it's a lot of moving parts once you start handling a lot of NPCs doing things in the background. So how do you guys keep track of that? How do you um, how do you go about it? Do you just kind of have a list of ideas? Hmm. I think Allard's probably the one most yeah, experienced with this. I, I, with I would agree. One. The rural uh, area. Well, yeah, because yeah, <laughs> uh, the, the whole thing happened in the same town, right? For book yeah. one. So. I was in, we were in Riddleport for 24 episodes. So uh, <laughs> uh, I know a lot of the NPCs that uh, they went back to were people that were a part of like the Temple of Calistria or they were a known kind of shopkeep alchemist what whoever kind of store people and for the most part it was just like yeah they would they would be at their at their spot when when the place is open basically uh you're gonna you're gonna if if you go to them at 2 a.m they're probably gonna be asleep and you don't have a key to their place so you you want to break into their house you want to do that um but uh the ones that they were more attached to i would have thing i would have where they were, what they were doing changed uh, based on the actions of of the of the players. So, I mean, this ended up being like mostly like their parents and what their parents were doing and how their parents were reacting to the things that they did or what happened to their parents because of the things that they did. Uh, just because the uh, it was like, I mean, the thing that they I knew they were going to come back to and the most obvious choice to like change up their routine than like the the shopkeep that they need to go to 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 restock or somebody that they um they know they needed to go to to get information uh sometimes it's good to just be like yeah you you can't find that person is it mysterious that you can't find that person does it make sense that that person is just like out in the town on some random spot doing 
doing. Do you find thing. that's a strategy that you use? Like, I, I hate to think about like it'd be impossible to prep all of that. Yeah. So is that a strategy yeah. where it's like, hey, you know, they're not they're not in their shop today, or they're not at the bar that they're usually at today. Uh, you don't really know where they are. You could ask around, and mm -hmm. then you figure out, okay, well, they're going to be digging into this the next time we meet, probably. Let's yeah. figure out what they were doing in the background. Exactly. Sometimes yeah. it's sometimes it's definitely a little diversion, like just get them off this trail so I actually have a, a moment to think about it type thing. Uh, but other times it's like, no, they. I, I have an idea of what what they what this character like is wants to do or some goal that they have or how they feel about the the PC where they um, can't necessarily find them in that moment or they do find them or that person eventually comes to them uh, and a lot of times it's just I, I think it's a lot of times off the off the cuff uh, depending on uh, on where we because we have to limit ourselves to the time of, a, of an episode so sometimes it's just like not the moment to really dive into this aspect of of an NPC uh, it's good to delay it so you can formally uh, figure out the situation that they're going to come across. Uh, and other times it's, uh, I don't know, uh, just a, a diversion tactic in, in some ways. Um, I know that a lot of times when the, like, maybe, maybe even based on the interaction that they had with that NPC is going to change the next interaction with that NPC in a way. It's not always going to be kind of a static thing. Uh, One thing I might suggest, I mean, I, I've not really had an experience of, of having to do that before. I mean, maybe like on a small scale, right with new elysium and stuff like that but yeah i feel you on of, that i'm like oh they're but they're all in like one contained area right, they're not right. in the city right um so like it kind of takes me back to some of my back in my day <laughs> play, uh computer games or whatever like computer adventure games there's like you know phases basically that happen depending on where they are at at the story where where npcs are going to be during those phases so you kind of have just like a general all right for part one and part two of book one this is kind of the phase of where npcs are going to be or like what's going on in their life so they're you know frank the barkeep is just going to work every day he's off on the weekends you know you can find him at home on the weekends and he's at the bar weeknights boom but then in phase two which is like the back half of book one some shit's gone down in the city and now he's at the bar but he's got bodyguards around him or he's not at the bar and the bar's closed when he normally should be because he's out doing something because of what happened in the city whatever like trigger went off in the city so that's something you might want to consider is mm -hmm. like kind of taking your book and breaking it into phases of all right this is where the npcs are during these particular parts for sure uh just a, a little example that's like a small npc that i had a little shift happen uh it was just like the a host uh that greeted them uh, almost every time they went to the temple of Calistria. i think i just kind of offhanded mentioned uh just rping that she was she was uh looking to become more of a of a priestess of Calistria instead of just like the host at the at the local temple brothel uh <laughs> so when eventually enough time had passed and i was like yeah she probably would have maybe gained some things i know that another uh character here who was the mother of one of our pcs uh was was not in the temple at this point so that definitely leaves an opening for another little priestess to kind of uh, assume a higher role and it, it I, I think it was kind of impactful when like that character wasn't greeting them at the door an, anymore and then they're like oh what's she doing it's like oh she's a full t uh, priestess right now she's probably with a with a guest and it kind of like it, it stung in a weird way I, I feel and it was just kind of interesting I remember that moment and oh you could hear you could hear their heart breaking mm -hmm. I loved it <laughs> I loved it um that character had a girlfriend at the time though too so right. shame on him. Shame. Shame. <laughs> Player call out. Um, Player character call out. Right. 
you know, I, I, my take on this one is, uh, I, I tend to be, um, to, I, and I even, I even hesitate saying this out loud. I am a low prep GM. Mm -hmm. I, I don't like pigeonholing myself into things. And, and, and part of that is I have, or, and I've even got them arrayed outside my monitors right now, sticky notes of every M NPC that my party, or that I should take into consideration with where my party is at at any given point in the adventure. And sometimes you feel a hole in movement or a transition from one portion to the next, where whether it's overnight or during downtime or whatever the case is. And when I feel that lag, I just grab a sticky note, I check my notes for that NPC, and I inject them there. I don't plan for them to be there, but sometimes you can feel what's yeah. going to be the most impactful uh, that I really way. Like that. I, like, I like that style of it. I think eventually the list gets large, right? Especially yeah, Especially if you're, if you're stagnated in a location. The list gets large, and so... Or the entire NPC travels everywhere with the party. <laughs> yep, yep. They're the always gets there. Large. And sometimes yeah. sometimes I think using that approach, you can you can kind of match up the um, the correct voice for the, for the information that needs to be given or for the... Um, for the the mood or the theme you can you can kind of or hey this npc really hasn't ha interacted with the party in a while maybe they uh maybe they're the one that hey remember me i'm here <laughs> they're the one that gets to give this information or they're the one that's there when they go looking for something um but yeah I, re I really like i think i think note taking has its place but once you once you blow up your npc world it's it's like I said, it, it gets impossible to figure out where everybody is at every given time. Right. Um, yeah, they're wherever you need them to be, man. Yeah. Guys, we're coming up on the halfway <laughs> point, but I do not want to get to the halfway point before we have a little segment that we've just started doing that is player advice. Player advice. And the theme of this player advice is how to best interact with these NPCs that, you're, that your GM is presenting you. Um, whether it be an NPC that um, that you feel you should maybe take the hook on or an NPC that's suspicious. Um, we as GMs present a lot of NPCs to you, and so we're going to give you some advice as players on how, uh, for lack of a better term, you can interact with the NPCs in the best way to get you the best information from your GM. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep, yep. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, somebody else start on that one. Okay, I, uh, I, from, and this is partly from a GM perspective, but uh, you know, it, 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 I get a chance to play every now and then. It's it's important to recognize the hook when it gets dropped. Right? There's a moment where you as a player are asking the game master for, you know, what's happening right now? Who's around? What's this person doing? And you're, you're searching for something, right? And you'll find it because your GM will give it to you, right? Your GM will give you that moment that you're looking for if you go looking for it. But if you recognize when a hook is getting dropped in front of you, uh, it's good to ask yourself, what would my player or what would my character do with this hook? And how if how are they going to respond to it if they're going to respond to it at all um make that choice as the hook gets dangled that's that's the first part of it you have to learn to recognize those hooks part of that's knowing your your game master every game master mm -hmm. does these things different um mm -hmm. so the longer you play with some them some of us play hard to get <laughs> <laughs> right some right our, some yeah. of our hooks are hidden pull behind uh, pull that lure back. Pull that hook back. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, the, the hooks are there, and whether or not your character would want that hook to be something that they care about, go back to session zero a little bit. You're there to progress the story forward, recognize the hook, and decide what you're going to do with it, and interact with the hook, then interact with the NPC. That's that's the way I like to do it personally. I think that's really good advice. Yeah. Uh, one thing I would present to players is, much like we've often said for GMs to know your table, uh, players 
same deal, know your table um, and, and know your GM in the sense that sometimes your GM is dropping an inconsequential NPC. You've all felt it as players. You've all, you've all known when some of these NPCs are, are just a barkeep. Mm -hmm. And so the more that you, you pick and choose where you want to have that ha ha fun time and mess with the GM and, and, you know, make them do a monkey song and dance on a, (laughs) on an NPC they just came up with, uh, picking and choosing that is, is a really good way to keep that fresh when it does happen. So I'm, I'm kind of going away from the plot here and saying, don't make your GM jump through hoops for every NPC they introduce just to yes. sometimes your GM is just trying to make the world feel alive. Please. Sometimes yeah. they're just trying to inject characters in that make, you know, a barkeep is a barkeep, but it, it's trying to make the world seem like it's a living, breathing thing. And you as a player can pick up on that and not call them on it every time. I know there, <laughs> I know <laughs> some of us have players that, that like to do this, and it's it can be funny and it can be really fun and sometimes it does develop really memorable characters but i would say you as a player have the ability to use that sparingly and to make the moments when that does happen really a, a lot more fun and elevated yeah. than they are when it's every time i'd but say I agree. Uh, you know and kind of the other side of that same coin is when you have an npc that's obviously like giving a prepared speech or giving like a prepared beat, you know, like just ask yourself before you interrupt with your joke, is this funny enough to interrupt this? (laughs) Like, is it gonna, is the laughs gonna be right? Cause in in, like, I'm joking (laughs) there, but like, seriously, sometimes like there's a lot of love and emotion that goes into crafting some of these scenes and it can be deflating for a GM to have that kind of just punctured for like a kind of halfway funny joke or like wh- whatever, you know, like, yeah, I don't want to like poop joke for sure. Yeah. I don't want to be like, Oh, boo hoo us. But like there is, there is a, a bit of emotional toll that goes into being a GM. And if you're a GM, you, you know what I'm talking about. Like you're trying to make something memorable and fun for multiple people at a table that all have different expectations and wants, you know? And so when you've taken the time to set up a moment with your NPC that you know that the that the players actually want, like you're like, this is a moment that you've been telling me you've wanted, you know, in so many words, and here we are at this, and you, you're, you're cutting through just to get get a little thing in, whatever it is, or to like, call you out on something that can that can especially for a new gm if this is their first time doing it and the first time they're like putting themselves out there like that it can deflate their will to ever put themselves into their characters again you know and all of us can take it and like don't don't get it twisted i'm not saying that any of us here have a problem with our players we're all friends we that's why we're doing it you know but i just know that that can be a, a tough thing, especially for a new GM who's trying to like bring, take all this advice that we've given them in the first half to bring it to your table, you know, and, and you shut them down in the middle of that. Just be wary. Yeah. Be yeah. Wary. I mean, I, I mean, as, as, as overall player advice etiquette, thank you. Uh, be, be kind to your new GMs. Even if it's somebody from your close friend group who doesn't GM very often, we put ourselves in a vulnerable position running your table. And and I'm going to sound like maybe I'm 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 pandering to our group, maybe or to GMs as general here. You know, like be nice to us, please. Uh, my right, feelings, right. but but for serious, <laughs> feelings but, hurt. Uh, <laughs> we we do put ourselves out there. It is a GM vulnerable Sappy position. Hour, am I right? Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I preferred Fappy Hour. Mm, we had wow. uh, that's the after party. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, after hours. It's it's. Uh, 
you know, and, and even players get this to a certain degree too. When you're really honestly role playing a character, that's a vulnerable position that you're putting yourself in as a person to your friends and respect that. It, it, sometimes it's, it's easy to turn a joke on what could be a serious situation because you find yourself maybe a little uncomfortable because it's a serious situation. But imagine what, what that person is putting themselves into, you know, to try to emotionally prepare to drop that very savvy moment, to drop that very heavy, you know, plot point. Um, respect that. Uh, you want these people to keep running games for you. I think it goes beyond your GM, though. Like, your other players you can tell when your other players are about to have a player moment with your GM. And all I would say as a player in the position of the sideline is please do not like, do not try and step on that other player's toes when they're trying to interact with that NPC that is clearly important to their backstory. Right. Don't play main fiddle. I don't give a shit if you're the party face. Do not talk. <laughs> do, do not talk beyond pleasantries to that NPC. Let it happen because you're going to know within 30 seconds whether that is an important NPC to one of your one of your other mm -hmm. players. And I would highly advise player advice. Just let them have the moment. Mm -hmm. Do not interject, whether it's a joke or whatever, but I'm talking specifically about like at, in character, do not interject in that moment either because mm -hmm. I guarantee you your character the character that you are playing would be more respectful than that mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah um sure uh i would say that it goes along with like knowing who's gming for you but being able to pick up on uh, when the gm is kind of giving you a a, a hint uh versus telling you to go uh straight for something is kind of a, a delicate, uh, I don't know, sl a slippery slope. So, mm -hmm. like, there are just knowing almost the difficulty level of the neck of the thing that somebody is the GM is is talking about, or being able to recognize uh, when their when their character isn't is being like super confrontational with you and like trying to pick a fight it's usually something that they know the party could deal with uh, in any of their s skills or varieties of ways to go about it. But if, like, the that NPC is more, like, looming or, like, subtly threatening, I think that's a key that maybe this isn't the time to try to attack them. There's there This is just, like, a plot point that's going to kind of get you to the point when you're leveled up enough to... Uh, actually confront this person yeah like let let the gm give you the hints that you're you're outmatched for this you know yeah. like be, oh yeah be and gm advice that. give the <laughs> yeah. give the give clear the hint that. like yeah. this give guy casts a whole person mass <clears throat> yeah yes. don't fuck with that guy don't do uh, it there there's actually a guy that i used to play under who had this thing that he just made up called the fighter check where it would be a d20 and add your base attack bonus and if you cleared the you know DC by level for that check, you'd get an idea. Oh yeah, I could take this guy, or no, he could totally <laughs> uh, kick the shit out of me. That's interesting. Um, that's a good one. I, I like that. It was that. Yeah. That's a GM advice. Sorry, wrong segment, but uh, well, I, I really enjoyed it. Player well, advice. Uh, Ask your GM for it. <laughs> yeah, uh, check. <laughs> I will say that we've given like a lot of like players don't do this, don't do this, or you know like scolding players in our player advice section and we mean everything we just said by the way but i will say that on the other side that when your gm gives you a riff opportunity go with it like go riff with it you know like that's because we know that y'all like to do that like don't get it twisted we know that y'all like to riff and just talk shit to an npc if we give you an npc that's obviously a punching bag dude get your jollies out <laughs> you know like <laughs> Or, or or half, the time, a... half the time you're introducing like an NPC and even if it's off the top of your head, you're like, oh, I'm going to make this guy like a mechanic, like a starship yeah. mechanic. Right. Guess who's going to want to talk to this guy? Like, right. do it. Do it. Yeah. Like, talk to this guy. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, those those moments are where, where you get 
you get to have the fun with it, you know, where you riff back and forth and, and, and do it. Like I will say in those moments, those are the appropriate moments. And when they are go, go ham on it, you know, and, and, and have those moments. Um, but yeah, it, I think it all comes down to knowing your table in this, in this case, knowing your GM, putting the time into understanding your GM's habits and ticks and kind of tells that they're, that I know that we all have different tones for different types of information giving, you know what I mean? When we're, it's time to move things along. There's a tone for that when it's a, <laughs> Hey, pay attention. This is really important. There's a tone for that. You know what I mean? And it's like, I don't really know where we're going to go from here. So I'm down to just kind of do whatever. There's a drunken tone for that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, and Whiskey then, GM came out to play. Let's play. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Get this man sometimes a, uh, <laughs> uh, a PC will maybe go back to a character or, or find a character to get information from that you didn't, as a GM, didn't necessarily uh, foresee. And being okay with kind of leading your GM to realize that this person might also have a version of the information that you're looking for. That kind of happened with me where um, one of our characters went back to the Temple of Calistria. Like, why wouldn't the bartender there? This is a, a, the house of the main information of all the town is being seduced out of everybody in this place. Why wouldn't the bartender there have like a, a, an idea of kind of what's going on? And that was something that uh, call out Eli brought up to me that I, I, I wouldn't have thought that I could uh, have this player, this character kind of give them a vital piece of information. But because they asked this character something kind of specific, I had to adjust and think, yeah, why that person would know or roll a check on it. And uh, yeah, so you can, as a player, discover kind of new fonts of information and not being like don't necessarily I wouldn't like really lean into that but if there's definitely someone set up or somebody adjacent that you can think of that you yeah help the help the GM uh, discover more of the story I think what we haven't said is that even out of game you can you have the full power to tell your GM Hey, I'm really interested in this character you yeah. just brought into the session last time. Yeah. That's amazing. Do that because yeah. oh then, you know, then I can make that then I can make that character more interesting because we're talking this whole time about how we have to take the time to flesh these characters out whether it's through improv or through planning. Either way, that's so helpful. And oh, that yeah. gets you a gold star as a player because it's like if you tell me you're really interested in talking to this dude, I'm going to devote some fucking time to making that dude interesting and have the information that you're looking for. Yeah, here's a and note about what's going to lead to my enjoyment at the table. <laughs> uh, every GM is going to look at that and go, thank you for that note. Mm -hmm. I will make sure you have fun at the table, right? Communication right. is key. I feel like yes. we bring this up all the time, but it's an important point. Yeah, sometimes you're not ho throwing hooks to each other. You're just th giving out a hand, you know? <laughs> Come, follow me. <laughs> I think on that note, it may be time to take our mid-session break. I do have a uh, an interesting question to start us off on, but now would be the time, folks in the chat, if you have any questions for us, please start peppering us with them. We'll start pinning them. I have been pinning some uh, as this conversation has gone on. But uh, we'll use our handy dandy Adam to uh, pose the <laughs> listener questions to us and uh, we'll answer anything you have. So um, see you in a bit. Yeah, see you in uh, let's call it let's call it an even eight slash nine o'clock. How's that sound? Yeah, that's good All for right. me. All right. All right. Perfect. Hey, thanks for hosting us this week. No problem. Appreciate it. <laughs> Doing good. We'll see you guys in a bit. Bye. We're back, baby. <laughs> back hey. in, back in the, back in the shit, boys. Back. We're back in the, the shit. Town. Back in the shit. The back. Thing. I hope everybody got new beverages because Dude. I'm ready to rock some uh, some listener questions here that revolve around what we're talking about, which is making your NPCs good NPCs, man. That's what yeah. it boils down to. And yeah. 
the first one I wanted to start us off on is I think something that most of us have dealt with in our player backstories. And it is how do you deal with GMing an NPC that is specifically related to your players? Because there's there's a lot more player agency that goes into that character than there is your average NPC. So how do you how do you balance that? How do you navigate that? Is this a listener question or is this a Griff question? This was the one I wanted to start us off on. I it like was, it. It's it was the one that question. got cut from uh, cut for time. Uh, on the front end. My answer on this one's extraordinarily short. Uh, my answer to this would be kind of the first book of our campaign. I was going to say, you're going to have to spend a ton of time on this one, Allard, right? Um, no, my, my players don't like having familial connections in our games. Um, they like to use families to build on their characters. So I have the closest I've gotten to a familial NPC uh, is... Uh, spoilers for mine here one of my one of my players has a very direct creator created tie in to uh, a rival circus right um, so there was an adversarial familial connection if you could say um, so to be honest I kind of just played it like another antagonist um, but it's good I think just if, if I had that running in my game to determine whether or not that familial connection is uh, positive or negative, is that familial connection a protagonist with your party or an antagonist, um, or even just like a guiding compass, whether that be positive or negative to the party or that character. Done. <laughs> we did it. Uh, we shit. I mean, for real, Allard, like your whole first, you know, yeah. a book of the AP was, was how you handled that. Yeah, because like, everybody wrote a familiar, a familial uh, attachment. And since this was kind of our, this isn't our, our first campaign that we started playing or whatever, but this is the first one that I knew that we were really going to like go for. And everyone made young characters. So I was like, all right, I'm going to make you guys typical adventurers and you're I'm going to test these familiar familial connections to to see what it evokes out of you. So, I mean the the goal is to uh develop story with these characters and story uh in a lot of cases uh comes out of of a conflict. So, if you have a uh, a negative fil familial connection, you want to explore that rub and then the goal of uh, uh, like what would make it a story is to like change that or to overcome the the negative parts and see if they can maybe connect somewhere else. And if not, then they have a uh, like a hole in their heart basically that is going to drive them for the rest of the time that uh, it's away, r regardless of it if it was a, a good. Uh, connection or a bad connection uh, and then if you have a, a good connection you definitely want to ex explore what makes it a good connection and then see if there are like test the the pcs to see if there is any rub you can you can suss out because that's where conflict and kind of story uh happens and i mean i I guess I I put them through a lot when it came to the, <laughs> their parents that they that they <laughs> they made for the story. So, Alard, right, I guess what I would ask is how much of their parents is back and forth between you and the player, kind of figuring out their backstory, and how much of that is you riffing as a GM, or right. you you breathing, I guess your own thoughts and your own role playing into the character's parents. I gave them the opportunity to tell me about any family that they had and like the little sheet that I sent out right away. And then after that, it was kind of me breathing life into the situation or uh, me giving the moments to, uh, to, for us to kind of improvise and see where this connection is. Uh, I knew where, um, like I had ideas to explore uh, how to 
kind of change how they connect with each other and like give them a reason to leave the town. I think the the biggest re- thing that I, reason I did that was to give them a reason to leave the town that they grew up in that I knew that they were going to have to eventually leave and I don't know if they they just wanted to like hang out with their parents all the time it'd be it'd be harder for them to up and leave on the short notice that it was going to happen so any strained relationship is on you it it, it is <laughs> i think the strained relationships was on me but i knew that uh like a couple they uh, a couple of them like we knew that they were they butt heads or they didn't get along uh, or like one of the parents was a little bit kind of would go either way like she she would be one extreme or another is kind of how i played her um did you talk to your players about how you wanted that relationship to develop or did you kind of just let it nope. happen <laughs> I, let it, I let it happen okay. i i i've my gming is me uh testing uh my players all the time to just see what they do without me going over it with them in a lot of cases <laughs> you know it, maybe it, that's bad of me i don't know it's been no fun so i mean far. it's it's definitely there are two paths to tread when you do that both i feel are equally valid mm-hmm. um <laughs> you know i just give family member npcs to other players to play that's what yeah, I I've, no, I've noticed that about you. That's what I do. It's weird that it's happened that way, but like, uh, I'm trying to going to try to speak vaguely here to not give away too much spoilers here. But I have a player who their parents were important to their backstory, and during that conversation, it was a very back and forth conversation. You know, like they were telling me, you know, kind of helping characterize their their parent at that time of their backstory well when they come back into the story many 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 years have passed and so then that's on me to flesh out and, and because the player and and therefore the player character wasn't doesn't know what this parent has been doing all this time mm-hmm. you know and so that part is fleshed out by myself but then they come back and like I honestly did give that to another player to play. And so that NPC then was, was then characterized by a third person, like, you know, another player. That's around. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, um, so it's, <laughs> that's a, I just, I, I don't, I think my answer to your original question, Griff, is that it's very dependent on the player and the NPC in question, you know, like, the circumstances around which how much the player character would know about that NPC, you know, sure. if it's somebody that they've been with all the way up to the present and like known their whole life, then they absolutely need to have some input into that NPC and who they are, because you need to sell it that they know who they are. And so the player has to have some buy-in and some into that, you know, to, to find their kind of motivation and all that kind of thing. So, yeah, I think it just depends on the situation, really. Yeah, I've run into a somewhat unique agency conundrum where I find myself uh, playing a lot of my player characters uh, at certain points in the adventure, uh, characters that my players have come up with, and my approach to that is that I, you know, I started the game letting everybody know that hey, I'm going to use a mechanic in Pathfinder that has the potential to make your player character an npc that i could later use everybody be aware of that but also um every time i do something like that i'm thinking about the situation that i'm going to present ahead of time and i'm also presenting that situation ahead of time to the player whose character it is i think it's really important especially if it's someone's actual character to be uh relatively transparent in what's happening what i came up with does that kind of fit the your concept of the character to a degree and if it doesn't how can i make it fit better but also like hey i want you to (laughs) i'm not going to voice this character i want you to role play this character in the situation that i've just presented so just be ready to do that here's here's the pieces that fall into place and here's where you're going to be here's where this character is going to be when they get reintroduced in some way 
So I found that I don't really, I haven't really had to deal with a lot of the familial stuff, but <laughs> playing someone's character can sometimes be a, a touchy spot. And I think, uh, you know, my players have very uh, firm opinions of, of what kind of character their characters are. Mm -hmm. So I kind of, I feel like I have to run that kind of stuff by them whenever I do that. Gotcha. Yeah, I just thinking about when uh, in like a cut scene i've i've played my characters my players characters before in just kind of describing the situation and it's always I, since i don't talk with them it's always reassuring when i get like a head nod or yeah, that, that, that was just something. like them. yeah that was good okay thank you well y'all we have a lot of listener yeah, questions yeah let's let's uh, let's go. hop over to the listener questions here adam i have pinned yeah, Hopefully see, we got every a, question. Yeah, we got a good selection yeah. here from quite a variety of, of listeners, so that's really nice. We're going to start off with one from Perfect Bacon, otherwise known as Eli, from the Dice <laughs> Crisis. It's actually not a question, uh, but it's one story from each GM on when an NPC you plan to have become beloved was rejected or just skipped over. Who was the one that got away for each of you? Ooh, they're in deep thought, guys. That's, uh, that's a tough thinking. question. Yeah, that's that one is tough. Question, man. Uh, uh, I know mine, um, but yeah, I've had the it. opportunity to read these questions ahead of time and prepare myself. Um, there was a, a, a Tamron, if any of you have gotten that far in the show, I mm -hmm. think most of you have, um, was a character that I thought was going to be really cool because as a character on paper, she's really cool, but I did a terrible job playing Talmarin. It's probably my, in my opinion, my worst NPC performance to date. And it, and I, so I think it like took away from what I thought was going to be a, a, a cool character that the players were going to like to becoming like a straight up throwaway NPC that it was like, all right, like we got what we need from you. We're out, we're out of here, you know? And that was, that was, and that's okay. You know, like, my feelings weren't hurt about it and I tried something weird with it and I tried something that I wasn't very proficient at as far as a manner of speaking like a particular dialect and it just fell flat you know so that that's my answer I think for me I expected uh, when I introduced the crooked kin which is a in, in my story it's a group of carnies uh, like a traveling carnival uh, I expected the leader the ring leader uh, Captain Caleb in my story to be the one that the NPCs latched onto, and I think I think both the strength of the um, of some of the characterizations in the book uh, and the interesting nature of these this kind of like traveling freak show led my players to be more interested in some of the side characters in that mm -hmm. uh, and took away from some of the spotlight of the ringleader, and so I felt like. Although he was a friend of the party, they they really didn't come to him. They came to the secondary characters in that in that particular group, and they were way more drawn to those secondary characters. So it's partially my fault for uh, for laying out those secondary characters as also as interesting characters as the ringleader, and not really making him the main focus. But mm -hmm. I, I really felt like they were gonna they were gonna treat him as like the go to person, and they definitely didn't. I think for me, um, this one was actually kind of hard, um, but I was running a game uh, for my beloved murder hobos, who we don't do recording for. They're just my beloved mur murder hobos. Um, we played Strange Aeons, and in the first book of Strange Aeons, you start off as a bunch of am amnesiacs in a, a ruined insane asylum where you're trapped and you can't leave the insane asylum and it's kind of divided into two factions um they ended up a catching really hard on the leader of the first faction that they met but when i introduced the the leader of the second faction who is like kind of a, a, a doctor in the asylum I really intended and and put him forward as an intelligent character who had the answers to things um, who who you know was going to be a font of information of logical information given the mystery that was put in front of them 
and they completely and utterly ignored this guy. I tried to engage with that party with this NPC several times, and I think it was the third or fourth time that they full-on rejected him that I did the thing we talked about earlier, which was take a character that they did love and deliver the information that way instead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that one, I'm not going to say hurt me, because... It taught my, you though. I, it it did. It did teach me. It it taught me that, like like I you know we had talked about about a little earlier when it's when you're delivering a hook to your party through an NPC, you have two jobs: deliver the hook, and make them love the NPC enough to take the hook. Um, but they didn't love the NPC, so they wouldn't take the hook. So we had to deliver the hook in some other way. All right, uh, Allard, do you have an answer? Uh, the closest thing I can think of is uh, we had like I I homebrewed in a a troop of of kind of carnival not l literally carnival people uh, Desnan gypsies Varesian gypsies uh, and two of my players they broke off from the third and went and like got their fortunes told and I kept hinting that there was another cousin to one of the guys who like did a uh, haro cards but he's like i don't i'm just doing i'm just like reading the cards i don't have the divine magic and i i hinted a couple times that his cousin had the divine magic to go and get like legit red and uh nobody nobody went for that they took you up on it yeah. uh okay i'm gonna join two questions together for the next one because i think they're kind of talking about the same thing um but i'm gonna i want to ask them distinctly so haley from Hideous Laughter ask, uh, how do you prevent falling into the same type of voice or personality every time? I think like included in your response should be the answer to Sir Newt's question. So I asked Griffin this the other day, but how do you keep track of your character voices? Um, you know, how do you remember which is which? Uh, you know, what kind of, how do you distinct your voices and how do you prevent yourself from falling into habits with your voices? And we talked a little bit about this earlier in the, in the main discussion, but let's take a second to kind of really talk about Tyler, what is your craft for doing a voice and, um, and, and like remembering which voice goes with which character? Uh, remembering which voice goes with, with char which character. I've actually only recently done this because of the tools that are available to me as a podcaster, but I actually clip the voices that I do early on and put them in a file that I have NPCs. So then I'll go back when, when I know that an NPC is going to be in a session or in an episode, I will go back and I'll review that voice because I want to keep consistency the best that I can. Um, I mean, I do that, but I don't do it. Like that's so smart. Like to mm -hmm. take a clip, I'll just go back and like scrub to try to find the part in the episode oh, yeah. where I, the yeah. NPC oh, is. Dude, right when you're editing, just clip it. Yeah, just. Clip I, I have it. like a weird. Oh, I have like a just weird like, photographic knowledge yeah. of like where each NPC, which episode each NPC showed up in. So I'm just like, well, that's back in 43, and let's go. Well, and that's not <laughs> exactly <laughs> right. That's not exactly good advice for us to give people who don't run shows, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, I mean, record yourself doing the voice. Though, that, that's that's not a bad idea either like right just on your phone just record yourself doing the voice and say my name is so and so and this is my voice and then here is my catchphrase that i use or your hook phrase your that's what phrase. i was gonna say that the hook phrase yeah, yeah the hook phrase. phrase i don't even need the recording if i have a hook phrase i remember it yeah absolutely yeah. I'm if, I have, if i have like uh you know i'll give an example like Duristan, like oh, I know it, you know it, everyone. You know, I, I, I got it. I, I remember the character because it's something he says all the fucking time. Right. So huh. if you have a hook phrase, I mean, it gets annoying. But if you have a hook phrase, it's easy to fall back into the voice. Man, yeah, I, I, I really want to test Griff on this real quick. What's Horace's hook phrase? Oh. <laughs> 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 I always found it. I didn't. I don't necessarily have a hook phrase, but I always found that I found a character's voice by like saying their name in a, like how what kind of accent or mannerism whatever felt right when they said their own name. So that kind of helps link the voices to the the NPCs kind of. I will um, say when I was prepping um, New Elysium with all those NPCs, on. Roll 20 or, you know, if you're doing it at home, you can do it on note cards or whatever. But like I did put like a quick one sentence 
this is what this you know because as i was going through it and like learning each character and figuring them out i would find a voice and then i would make an a, like a written note on their little npc handout you know stat block it's not even stats but just info block really and I'd say okay this one slight eastern european accent this one haughty british accent this one boisterous gravelly you know just to kind of remind myself okay this is the voice that i went with that's exactly how i do it adam i mean i think the clip thing is a great idea but as a as a gm that maybe doesn't record yourself i think that's probably going to be your your yeah. best bet is just writing a sentence or two on the voice you came up at the time what I find is that I, I always save the voices that I like to fuck around with uh, as my main NPC voices. I think we talked about this in making, you know, originally in making an interesting NPC, but an NPC that I know is going to talk a lot, I like to give them some kind of fuckery type of voice. And uh, using that, I'm usually like, oh, that's my that's my uh, shitty Arnold Schwarzenegger impression. Like, that's <laughs> my, you know, and it's very easy to slip back into that because I'm just thinking, oh, I, you know, that's the voice I do when I, uh, when I get drunk and do this. Well, or and <laughs> to, along the same lines, uh, I, I don't do this. I don't like doing this. I don't do it in my games, but GCP does this thing where they cast NPCs. Um, yeah. I, I personally dislike it, but it's a good tool for a gm to have a voice because if you if you have a you know an actor in a role that you're trying to maybe not emulate necessarily but to get a, the texture of that npc um it it's sometimes good to cast that npc um again i don't personally use that tool but i think that would be an easy way for people to do things too we consume so much media uh that it's probably pretty easy to call back to something like yeah. that it's always good to have a reference. Yeah, especially if you're doing voices that are impression style. Yeah. Yeah. It's like yeah, that's easy. Okay. Yeah, it's it's this impression that you do. It's that impression that you do. Yep. All right, good questions. Uh next question comes from Krusty Cruss. Uh so, do the style of your descriptions influence how the party perceives the character? And he gives an example here. Their green coat is slick with rain versus their drenched sickly green coat is hanging limply off their body. Of course, there's a difference in vibe and tone in those two descriptions. I don't trust number two implicitly. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> right, right. Or the or like they they something is off for sure about. But that. But player That's advice: true. don't always read into it because sometimes I'm doing the second one to fuck with you. That's true. It's true. <laughs> it's absolutely no. true. When I at least at least when I GM it, I'm, I'm doing it on purpose to fuck with you. Uh, one thing that I like to, uh, in, and this is how I mentally overcome descriptions as best I can, is I like to think less about how they look and think more about how they feel. When you're coming up with a description for something, if you have a, uh, I'm going to use this word a lot, the second half, I think, texture. If you have a texture of that person or whether it's their, you know, rough personality or that, you know, that silky smooth voice or whatever the case may be, uh, having a texture to go along with it helps too. I always find it's less about what they look like and more about what they smell like, which should be a part of every GM. <laughs> Smelling's good. I like smells. Uh, try to use all five senses if you can. <laughs> Specifically smell when you're meeting a new yeah. person. <laughs> Especially if your character has sand. It smells like chowder. Uh, okay. Well, moving on to the next question. Yes? Sure. All right. Uh, Egg, this is not the right place for this question, so I'm, I'm, cutting it. Egg, cutting it. Good question. Listener Big call cut. out. Question. <laughs> cut. It's not the right place. Uh, all right. I don't know what it was now. Damn. Uh, <laughs> I kind of do too. I'll find it. Search the pins. You know it to be true. <laughs> I just deleted it. It's gone. No. 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 Uh, <laughs> This is not really on topic, but I do like the question. Um, and it may be on topic, depending on your answers. By my love tart, ask, how you, have you guys ever noticed different drinks making you better at different GM aspects? I've been better at social interactions with gin and more tactical in battles with wine. So mm. this is this is really interesting because I, I was a psych major in college and I did uh, two papers on this 
this exact thing on whether different alcohol makes you actually act differently when you're drunk and whether it um whether it then like there are different types of drunk um and the the answer is a definitive no with a caveat and the caveat is that different alcohols are drank with different things and so everybody everybody says they have a tequila experience right everybody says oh tequila makes me crazy tequila makes me whatever uh but the you're blaming okay, maybe not lines. you allard but like fuck <laughs> off follow me on this journey okay are you about to the take the hook i shouldn't, for a I shouldn't have made a joke and deflated your point i'm sorry <laughs> take the hook for a moment <laughs> Uh, but the, but the reality of that is that most most people consume tequila in two forms, one being a shot and the other being a margarita. And the issue with both forms is that the shot is rapid consumption. The margarita is consumption with two dehydrating agent, agents, one being the salt and the other being the overly sour mix that is in the thing. And mixing it that way also leads to overconsumption. So when people say, oh, uh, tequila makes me crazy, it's because you either took shots of tequila, which was too much too quickly, or you drank it in, you know, something like a margarita, which also hid the flavor of the tequila and led you to drink it more. The reality of the thing is that if you drank tequila socially like a, you know, like, like maybe you would drink a whiskey like on the rocks and slowly... It wouldn't make I you crazy. I don't, I don't understand. What? Okay, hold on a second. Hold on a second. Whiskey slow. Two mm. two two things, Griff. I need <laughs> to have a full like blown cold. conversation with you about this at some point. Yeah, I feel this like is this fascinating. Is like a whole new like GM happy hour. This is fascinating. Don't talk yeah. about. But we're going to put the happy Fuck hour back. Games. In happy hour. Yeah. <laughs> we're doing happy hour. <laughs> yeah. No, but. Uh, I I do think it's a it's a matter of perception, a matter matter of how you consume it, and. There's also the less so than when you would take something like a psychedelic drug, which is a your perception going into it kind of leads to the trip that you go on. Mm -hmm. uh, Placebo. And so you can give yourself a bad trip if you go into it with a bad headspace. Mm -hmm. You often categorize different types of drinks as giving you different types of effects, which gives you a different headspace when you go into drinking them. Right. So it's sense. not necessarily what like, you drink. Oh, I'm it's how you crazy feel about right? what I'm you drinking drink. tequila. Yeah. You know, that being said, I, I do like drinking straight whiskey when I GM if it's going to be a role play heavy scene. But I think that's more because I will, you know, drink four fingers of whiskey where I, in the space where I would drink two beers and be loose. Right. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the sips are more powerful. So, 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 so basically what, what it boils down to is, uh, the, your mileage may vary based on how you drink it and how you feel going into drinking that thing. I will say Absolutely. to bring it, bring it around to the, to the question. It's not so much what you drink that changes how your characters are. It's how much you drink <laughs> that changes <laughs> how your characters are. <laughs> For sure. All right. Next question. I, that was fascinating. Take an inspiration, Griffin, for that. Uh, Boom. I'll, I'll bring it into hideous Tom Fuller. Yeah, Look what you've that. done, no, no, Adam. No, no, no. It's <laughs> <laughs> happy hour yeah. exclusive. It's it's a, this is only for happy hour. Uh, How intoxicants <laughs> affect role play. I'm sure at some point in the series of these GM happy hours, we will roll some dice, and you do have an inspiration for when that time comes. Boom. If you remember it. All right. <laughs> so, Woody, <laughs> ask, Woody, ask a question. Um, and I'm going to answer it before I even let you guys, because I think y'all will say the same thing. Whoa. Woody asks, what is the best NPC twist you have come up with? And my answer to that is, well, you have to listen to the shows to get that answer. Yeah, uh, that's, that's a fair point. True. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to give you the answer to Lost and you not have to watch any Lost. We all had to watch it, if you've watched it to get the nine answers we got. So I, I will say go. that I had uh, a twist twice on the same 
actual NPC person. There's two twists on him. <laughs> two you know, twists uh, on the same NPC. Double, a double, double twist. twist. My favorite. My favorite thing, and actually, uh, in my release schedule, I I'm way ahead of my own release schedule and what I do every Friday and what we release on Thursday. I think we're like a month and a half ahead, actually. Um, but uh, I really, really like pulling people back and forth. Being like, oh, I got this guy figured out, and oh, wait, no, maybe he's this other thing. But oh, no, I was right the first time, and wait, no, I'm now I'm second guessing myself. I love pushing and pulling expectations on NPCs. Yeah, and that in turn just makes that NPC feel like a deep, complex character. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And when that when that final moment hits, and that mo that that you know you're either going to be giving somebody the satisfaction of being right or you're going to give somebody the oh can i should have seen that coming moment it, yeah. it's it's all satisfying it's all fun um yeah i yeah. i love doing that that's tons of fun that last moment just reveals the last star in a constellation and you see the big dipper or something like that. yeah 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 the whole picture when it's all put together i do love doing that um okay Next question. Jay Pickle asked. So, Mrs. Pickle actually asked this question. Oh, hey. shit. Mrs. Pickle. Hey, bud. We got a, miss, we got a Mrs. Pickle. Tommy, uh, say hi to Tommy for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's an NPC trope you hate, and what's one you love to lean into? Ooh. Uh, crazy Wizard is fun to lean into. Yeah, okay. I'm with that. It's like mind-bogglingly smart to where they don't make any sense ever uh, that's that's fun see that's one of my pcs i can't lean into that myself oh, fair enough fair i enough. can't lean into that <laughs> um uh, I'll, I'll i'll take the opposite side of that uh npc tropes that i can't stand uh just like i actually can't stand having these in my party edgelord npcs nobody likes nobody likes that that's it's why not I make interesting. Those type PC or NPCs not recite says, emo poetry. Shut it down. <laughs> <laughs> it's, because, it's because I hate them so much. Yeah, I I can't. You know what we didn't talk about is what happens when a player steals an NPC from a GM. Because that's oh. what that's what Griffin did. GM call out to a player call out to a GM call out with uh, <laughs> with uh, what's his name? I can't. Even, you took him from me. My whole memory. You took him from my whole memory, Griffin. Yoink. 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 Yeah, yeah. He accepted that memory. <laughs> Look, I'm allowed to steal Lurch Word, okay? He made his accent so accessible. Entry level <laughs> accent, okay? Uh, uh, I'll say an another one that I found kind of fun is like just kind of a, a the, the, the bumbling doesn't really know, uh, doesn't really get what's going on, but still like tries to participate type NPC or just kind of. A, a stupid NPC that's down to riff. Down to riff. I'm yeah. down to fuck, down guys. To that's me. DTF. <laughs> it's me, Grogdar the Barbarian. DTF, yep. boys. Talk um, to me about anything are. you want. A trope that I that I like to do is the kind of dumb city guard trope. Like uh, I like to Monty Python the the city guard trope, nice. or you know, whatever. I have fun with that. The one that I that I don't like so much is kind of similar to Tyler. Not so much an edge lord, but somebody that's just like, you know, they're a paragon of virtue. And like, ugh. You yeah, know, I haven't like, even played any of those. You know, like <laughs> <laughs> my town's too seedy for that. <laughs> they're boring, yeah. yeah Unless yeah, where I wouldn't like, have to. <laughs> with a very large caveat, Adam, if they fall, I love watching the virtuous fall. In well, I'm pace. hoping that it's that, that's a player. I want yeah. that character to be a player character, not a non-player. So I've never I'm had that before. Have you guys ever uh, had a full-on paladin fall oh, in any oh of your my. games? Yes. Uh, spoiler alert: It happened <laughs> twice in my campaign. Did it? Oh god, I gotta catch up, man. I gotta catch up because I love that kind of stuff. <laughs> it, 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 yeah, it does happen pretty recently, but it happens twice. So, now, um, and uh, no, go ahead. No, I, I was just gonna say I. For whatever reason, I really don't enjoy playing cold calculating bad guys. I'm not into that. It's not the kind of character I like to run. Uh, I I don't I don't think 30 steps ahead as a game master, and so I don't like playing a bad guy that does because it requires to. me to do yeah. something like that, and it's just not my not my wheelhouse and not my enjoyment space. But I do really like uh, I really like playing like the party best friend. 
what I mean, whatever whatever trope form that takes, but it's usually like the dude they meet at a bar that they end up like powwowing with or like the the eccentric weirdo that they end up teaming up with. I enjoy those characters because honestly they're they're easy to make friends of the party. They're and I think that's I think I'm thinking of a ease of doing these things level as a GM <laughs> because everything is work. <laughs> and, uh, and so I prefer the stuff that I prefer the stuff that comes more naturally to me. That's more easy for me. And I think, um, you know, I at the end of the day, I love my players' characters, and I really like getting the chance to play their friend in whatever form that is. So I think that's it. it always takes the form of a trope because they never latch onto somebody for long that's not a tropey person, but. <laughs> Uh, it's usually a goofy person that they latch on to, and that, that's fun to me to play. I, I mean, I, I gotta say, I've ca ca colored me surprised that Griff likes playing goofy, weird characters, right? right? <laughs> um, Who could have thunk? Right? <laughs> um, okay. Good question, Mrs. Pickle. Thanks for participating. Um, next, we got one from, um, I hope I pronounced this right, but I guarantee I won't. Uh, Kaveron, Kaveron, Kaveron. Let's go with Kaveron. Uh, ask questions as a GM and coming in late. What do you guys do when PCs aren't quite asking the right questions to gather the info they want slash need? Ooh, want and need is a big difference. Mm -hmm. If it's information they want, let them leave it. If they're fuck. not asking the right questions, <laughs> fuck them. I, I mean, I, that, that's kind of my answer to a lot of these questions, isn't it? Um, uh, but, you know, if, if it's something that they need, maybe sometimes, I'm going to go back to what Griff said a little bit earlier, shotgun blast. Just just shoot it all out there and see what they pick up on. If they don't pick up on it the first time, shotgun them again. Sometimes they need that information. And if it's not, you know, a handout that you're giving them or, you know, if it's one of those uh, situations. Sorry, I said, because fuck them. That's why the BP in the chat and that, that distracted me. But uh, <laughs> if they need the information, you have to get it to them. And Sometimes you got to shoot both kneecaps. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes you do. <laughs> the double sometimes, tap with the Sometimes plot you gotta gun. curb stomp those PCs with info. <laughs> I, th I think it's not it's not very difficult to play a NPC that is intuitive, that can kind of pick up what they're putting down. Uh, and I think you can run it that way too. An, an NPC that's maybe thinking a couple steps ahead and gets the gist of what they're saying without them actually saying it. Mm -hmm. I think it's like, oh, so, oh wait, you mean this? Hmm. Like, mm -hmm. and then they're like, oh, oh yeah, we should ask you about that. That's yeah, a good I idea. You're and you're asking like, me about yeah, my you know, why would you ask me about something like this? Maybe it's something I know something about. Yeah. yeah. You're circling around something. That's... Well, and, and reward them for asking the right question. Right, right. Absolutely. Reward them for asking the right question. Uh, I, I am uh, notoriously stingy on hero points in 2E, um, unless I'm drunk as hell. But... Uh, yeah, I've gotten six in one drunk episode before. Yeah, that didn't go anywhere. Yeah, that did happens. It? Yeah. Um, but <laughs> I didn't use them either. <laughs> but you know, it's 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 one of those things where uh, you got to reward good behavior, and that, that sounds Pavlovian as hell, but uh, it's true. We have you to do it sometimes. Yeah, sometimes you got to ring that yeah. bell. Or maybe I have the information run into them in a way that they didn't necessarily expect um, like a giant bus with a platform on the side exactly. that says this is the information is <laughs> or if it's you just percentile table brothel encounter exactly. right. <laughs> oh, oh guess Killing what we're in the right. gathering information stage I need you to roll dice until you get the high enough roll for me to tell you what you're supposed to know you know keep yeah. keep using diplomacy to gather information yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Seems like you need another day in town. We'll do another diplomacy mm -hmm. check. Yeah. Yeah, just make a perception check. Sense motive. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> do yeah, it yeah. again. No, do it again. <laughs> um, guys, we're on our, our last question here. We have some what? kind of in the bank. So we'll see where we're at. Let's after. go to the bank. I feel like going late. That's just me. If you guys well, want to shut me up. Look, no, no. After hours is happening, you know. I suppose. It that, always happens. Don't worry about that. 
but we do have one last question that is on topic here. Um, well, it kind of is. It's kind of a reverse of an NPC situation. Gotta keep qualifying these questions, Adam. <laughs> yeah, I'm worried. I know, I know. <laughs> what kind uh, of is? Well, actually, it's not really about anything we've been talking about, but I like the guy that that posed it. Well, actually, I don't really well, like him that much, but he's Griffin, on all of our servers. So I, have, I, I, I feel obliged. Well, I don't questions. really feel obliged. But actually, you know, <laughs> it's the only question we have. So wait, do we take the power away from him now? Mm -mm. No. <laughs> no, I think we give him more power. Give him yeah. more power. Good. That's yeah. always the answer. Uh, a Zach of Opportunity asked, Great HH. That's happy hour, guys, in case you didn't know. Um, <laughs> I was wondering how y'all felt about GM controlled PCs in combat. How you balance supporting PCs with playing your allied NPC as you think they'd act, you know, say striking the killing blow on a boss. You know, what, do you want to steal those kills from your NPC or from your player characters as an NPC? I think that's kind of what he's getting at there. And just. How do you balance that of still making the PCs the hero when you have a GM PC? Yeah, I've gone about this in a couple different ways. Uh, I started out letting my players like grab the NPC and play them in the combat. And I, I guess for a, a show, I guess that felt like it kind of dragged too much or, hey, they didn't necessarily understand uh, the mechanics of this character. Uh, to play them as efficiently as this character would have been played by like a, a regular PC. Uh, for instance, like uh, them not knowing that a wizard's familiar can like you can cast a touch spell on them and they can run over and and cast that spell on on like that on the bad guy or something. Uh, more recently, I've been playing the NPCs in combat just to help things help move things along more quickly. Uh, I. And when the I, I do use it as a as a way to like show them that this is a this is a cool PC or NPC. Uh, no one's got like the final hit on a super important character before, but I've definitely let them take the the hits uh, for like a sub important person, and it ends up just being the PCs are like, damn, yeah, you're cool. You're I'm glad we have you around. It does, doesn't, I haven't had it really deflate my PCs yet, but I, I haven't really been by the, the methodology of give it to your players, whatever yeah. it is. If it's in combat, give it to your players. It's one less thing you have to deal with unless it's like a tenuous relationship or something where you're going to want to be able to do weird stuff. It's like, Give your players those NPCs. Give them the... I mean, I'll use an example from our show. Like, I gave every player a stat block for an additional character just so that I could run a bonkers CR scenario at them and run, like, waves and hordes of the undead at them and let them be badasses with not only their characters but with these other characters that had very different abilities to their own characters but that they could just like wow we're a party of eight when does this ever happen you know yeah. and it it was fun for everybody and i didn't have to run those extra characters i'm unless i have like two people playing i'm never gonna run a gm npc i just don't like it i, I don't like doing <laughs> it i don't like playing chess against myself i'm too dumb for that I've had fun with it because it, it has allowed me to show my players different mechanics that they wouldn't have thought of or take a route in a, in a combat that uh, kind of branches off into discoveries. My answer uh, is twofold on this one. I completely agree with Griff. Uh, give it to your players. But I'm going to ricochet it back to Allard. You have way more experience in this than I do because you have a three-man party. And you have the experience of all of us combined. I think it's just yeah. on your show right I, now. In, in that, yeah, and that on its own, I agree. And, and and I'm curious: do you have moments where where you see an opportunity to do an exposition with that GM PC to your players that you're just like, ah, they're not picking up on this the way that I wanted them to. Let me just give it to them as the NPC and I'll come up with a reason as to why they know that later. Have you ever used that as a shortcut to deliver the hook? Yeah, in combat in specific or just like in, in general? In general, in general. Uh, yeah, I've definitely, because like, uh, 
I I know from reading uh, the APs, you know that there are some sort of like little niche things that maybe they wouldn't ask to specifically look for, and having a uh, an NPC with the party that you know is interested in that kind of thing uh, helps bring out different elements of the story that maybe would have been glossed over. Like, uh, for instance, we have uh, a wizardly uh, woman with us, and uh, when they went to the library in a place, I immediately just had her go, like, look for books, and then I brought out a... Then she found a specific thing that she was thinking of could be relevant to their situation that uh, probably wouldn't have been found by the, the, other, the other folks in the room, but it still felt like it wasn't just, like... Uh, a shoehorn thing because this PC had been with them for a while and like I had kind of set up those actions for her before and giving her some autonomy outside of what the party asks her to do just kind of fleshes out that character as as a as a breathing part of the world um I you you don't want to I mean I try not to be heavy-handed with that kind of stuff and I've noticed that it's nice <laughs> when uh, for the players to know that they can ask this PC a specific question and if they don't know it off the top of their head, the information that they give them is going to be something relevant because I, I'm not often going to red herring my players with a, a person that's in their party. I'll say kind of circling it about, back to the original question. Uh, you know, if, if you're in a position where you are controlling an NPC in a combat situation, I mean, what I what I do almost 100% of the time, if not 100% of the time, is just play the buff role. You know, like mm -hmm. I, it's I do whatever actions that that NPC can do to make the character stronger or more defended. You know, drop heals, yeah. drop buffs, whatever. I'm not. You don't. That's the opportunity for a party to have somebody who's totally dedicated to not doing dps and just making them stronger you know utilize the eight and other yeah. actions yeah seriously yeah. what you know parrying fire covering fire there's so many different things that you can do i mean i'm talking starfinder terms here but i'm sure that there's equivalents in pathfinder of making the battlefield more difficult for the enemy and more advantageous for your for the players that's what a gmpc should do in combat every yeah. single time you know, I think it depends because I think like the GMPC should fall into whatever niche the party needs. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, I mean, if 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 they're having trouble hitting the boss or hit not the boss but hitting the enemy, you know, and this NPC happens to have <laughs> the right amount of energy, the right type of energy damage to to do what needs to be done, you know, you don't don't drag out a fight just to not be the person to do the thing, but. What it, yeah, I think maybe more general than I'll say is do what best befits the players to make them feel the most powerful or assisted, you yeah. know? Or I've used uh, NPCs in, in on like allied NPCs in combat to show them that something that they're scared of is something that they can accomplish and, and overcome. Right. Uh, or like, uh, yeah, the something isn't going to be as damaging as they think it's going to be as as players and something not something that they need to necessarily avoid at all costs uh, one other thing i'll say on why i've uh, decided to play some of these npcs in combat myself is like i had uh for a f first two books ish uh one player playing another character that they their player was in or their character was in a relationship with and like came with them on the combats and stuff and after a while you realize that they're playing twice as much in combat as your other two players and that's not necessarily a fair thing to do to them uh, i know i asked them just if it was if everyone was all right with it but i definitely like if there are going to be multiple multiple npcs in combat i think it's it's way more fair to to disperse them all out to the players than if you have one NPC uh, to give them to one player. Unless you're doing maybe like a, a switch combat thing like right. uh, UMLO and GCP. 
but that got that kind of got messy. But they did some funny <laughs> I've done that before uh, to horrible effect. Got messy. They had they, they almost forgot he was there half the time. Well, and he had like levels yeah. in six different classes. Yeah. Or <laughs> like whoever whoever it is this week gets to level them up. Well, <laughs> Sir Newt is swimming in here or swinging in here late game. He dropped a challenge for all of us. Uh, dude, I think this is a great one. I yeah, think so too. Good. This is good. <laughs> looked, yeah. uh, one more challenge, and we're gonna we're gonna end it on this, and then go to after hours. Um, but come up with a shopkeeper voice right now. Make them unique, but not interesting. But not interesting. <laughs> yeah. Who wants to go first? I mean, I will. If... Not interesting. Yeah. Be careful of the books. Now I want to know I about the that. books, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> you can't no, do that. The to books me. should be the books are interesting, not necessarily the shopkeep. Well, he's right? being vague about the books, so that makes me interested in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, backfire. I lose. <laughs> You've lost this challenge. You came into my shop. Why? I want guess it. that makes Close. you a combative shopkeeper, <laughs> which is in it itself. I think that's actually basically the first line I did of some random shop, like clothes shopkeeper. I they entered and I was like, mm, "What are you doing in my shop? <laughs> you here to buy me. clothes? You're wearing items, clothes, aren't you? What do you need clothes for? Items you want? What? <laughs> <laughs> Bad grammar. Good way to make them uninteresting. Right. <laughs> you hold a conversation with this guy. Yeah. He's, I mean, that was the cheap. challenge, right? Like, right, not right. to make a cool, interesting yeah. character, to make a unique character that's not interesting. That was a hard challenge. That is a hard I had challenge. The longest time to think about it. Well, because Griffin pinged it, but that's uh, that's my best shot shot at a non-interesting, unique shopkeeper. Please let me finish my Sudoku before we continue this purchase. Are we all going to be so boring? We... <laughs> I guess I'm... Would you enjoy apparently. the brown linen or the off-brown linen? <laughs> I can do your parade armor either way, but either way, it will be quite boring. There will be no flair in my shop because... I want to know why there's no flair, Griffin. Well, if you must know, it's because I'm an uninteresting person <laughs> and I dislike flair. I'm going to be upfront about this because, honestly, you are taking time away from me staring at the paint dry on the wall. <laughs> I feel uh, like if we didn't say any other questions for me as a shopkeep? Because I'm clearly kind of the hub of information you should be looking for. <laughs> <laughs> you enter the potion shop and it's obviously dead. The gnomish shopkeep looks at you and goes, Welcome to Perry's Potions. Take a number, take a seat, and wait. Now keep waiting. Keep waiting. Yeah, that's how you get him. <laughs> yeah, that's that. See, now it's funny. You like it was good <laughs> until you until you put it in the now. Keep waiting. Now there's damn. Now there's comedic timing involved in it, and you fucked it up. We're all just <laughs> too damn interesting, guys. Yeah, sorry. I can't. I can't do it. <laughs> you've gone and bored me again. <laughs> uh, you've come into the shop. Please refer to page sixty-eight. Or 268 of the um, uh, core rule book to look at what I have in the shop. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. getting meta yeah, now. Uh, roll on the D100 table to see what kind yeah. of items I have. <laughs> Hello. Hold on. You Let me check the, the, the population shopkeep. level of this town. Mm. Um, Please use my items. touch screen to order. Please use <laughs> the user interface and avoid speaking. Thank you. Please Actually, I think for Starfinder, I'm that's a pretty, robot. You can do that. <laughs> you can be like, uh, you're at a kiosk. Yeah. <laughs> you find yourself go. at a kiosk. But that's not unique. See, now that's utter utterly uninteresting, but it's the not unique. The kiosk is a, is a vibrant pink. <laughs> hey, guys, I only sell cheese. Do you want cheese now? Uh, it's, it's got a I'm also violently lactose intolerant. Yeah. It's interesting. <laughs> it's immediately interesting. So don't pour milk on me. Don't oh. do it. 
Newt, we all fantastically failed. Thanks for the awesome challenge. Yeah. <laughs> Keep them up. Yeah. Uh, listen, that, that wraps it up for uh, listener questions. Griffin, you want to take us out of here? Well, we thank everybody that joined us live and that is listening. Uh, for those of you that are just tuning in on YouTube, I'm Griffin from the Hideous Laughter Podcast. We have Allard from the Dice Crisis. We have Adam from Southern Tom Foolery, and we have Tyler from Min Max. Please check out everybody's show if you enjoyed what you heard. But otherwise, finish your drinks, because we'll see you next time. Or in the after hours. Or in five minutes. Yeah. <laughs>